Monsters is a true crime program about the worst human beings on the planet. These episodes contain graphic detail about murder, rape, child abuse, and torture. Please turn back while you still can. Viewer discretion is advised. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to our website, thisismonsters.com forward slash support. There you can find ways to support this show, as well as see a list of charities that help victims of violence. Kenneth Parnell was a child predator who managed to fly under the radar for far too long. His uncontrollable desire to be with young boys and his brazen approach to acquiring them would eventually catch up with him, though. This is Monsters. Kenneth Parnell was born in Texas during the Great Depression. His father abandoned their family when Parnell was eight years old. After that, he moved to Bakersfield, California with his mother, two half-sisters, and half-brother. He spent a lot of time in and out of juvenile detention and mental institutions. Parnell suffered from pretty bad mental illness. He tried to pull his own teeth out when he was four years old. He tried to commit suicide twice when he was only nine. The first time, he shot himself in the abdomen, and the second, he jumped off the roof of a barn onto a board with nails sticking out of it. It's been reported that he was molested when he was 13 years old by a man who was staying at the boarding house that was operated by his mother. Mike Eccles wrote about it in his book, I Know My First Name is Stephen, but Parnell has always denied it. Kenneth Parnell had already earned himself a three-and-a-half-year sentence in prison when he was only 19 years old. In 1951, he lured an eight-year-old boy using a deputy sheriff's badge that he had purchased from an Army-Navy surplus store. He abducted and raped the boy, which landed him in prison. He was sentenced to prison for lewd and lascivious behavior with the boy. He claimed in a 2000 interview that he did it because his wife at the time was pregnant and he needed to find another outlet. He was receiving treatment at Norwalk State Hospital when he managed to break a lock in the laundry room and escape. He was apprehended a few months later in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He did another stint in the 1960s for armed robbery, but there aren't many details about the arrest available. He had since divorced his first wife and remarried, and his second wife filed for divorce when he was in prison. In 1972, Parnell, with the help of Irvin Edward Murphy, kidnapped seven-year-old Stephen Stainer. Stephen was the younger brother of Carrie Stainer, who would end up murdering four women in Yosemite National Park in 1999 while living there as a handyman at the Cedar Lodge. Check back next week for more on that case. Another connection to Carrie was the fact that both Parnell and Murphy worked at the Yosemite Lodge, which was about 20 miles from the Cedar Lodge. Parnell had convinced Murphy that he was an aspiring minister and talked him into kidnapping a young boy. He told Murphy that it was so the boy could be raised in a religious environment. Irvin Murphy was described as a simple-minded, naive, and trusting man. Parnell started watching Stephen about a week before his abduction. He would watch the boy walk home every day from school, down the sidewalk, right past his car. He had struck up a conversation with the local postman, who had told him that Stephen had recently been in trouble and had received a whooping. Parnell knew that Stephen would be more likely to obey another adult since he had recently been punished. What a weird thing for a postal carrier to tell a complete stranger. But back then, people just knew each other's business. On December 4, 1972, Parnell told Murphy to hand out religious pamphlets to boys who were walking home from school. When Stainer approached, Murphy began talking to the boy. What happened that afternoon? Do you remember when you were walking home from school? Uh, yes, um, I was walking home from school and I was stopped by... A man along the street just a few blocks from my house and he um, asked me if I wanted to me or my my mother wanted to donate something to a church and I had told him that uh, my mother would probably want to and so he offered me a ride home I had um, refused the first time telling him that uh, my house is just a few blocks away and he had asked me several more times and after a while I had taken a ride 
And then uh, the car pulled up, and I got in, and they they passed the road that I was that I lived on, and I had told them that that was the road I lived on. They said that we'll just uh, call your parents to see if you can stay the night. Were you afraid? Uh, not that much. I was. A little bit. So he got in the car. They drove just down the street toward his house, but passed it, and Parnell was like, oh, you can just stay the night at my house. How random is that? And Stephen says he was only a little bit scared. Parnell drove about 25 miles east toward Yosemite National Park to a small town called Kathy's Valley. Parnell had a small cabin there, which happened to only be a few hundred feet from Stephen's grandfather's house. Neither Stephen or his grandfather ever realized they were so close to each other. What, what did they tell you as the days went on, why, why they were keeping you with them, and what did they tell you about your family? Well, the first night they had said they called my parents and said it was all right that I stayed the night. The second night they said that they had called them again and said they, that I could stay another night. Then... Um, one of them went, to, uh, went out and came back and said that he went to court and got in possession of me and said that I was his. How did you feel about that when you heard that? Um, I had really forgotten what I felt that at that time. It was kind of a shock to me. You called him, I'm, I've been told that you called him dad. How long before you started calling him dad? Do you have any idea when that started? Um, that started about a week after my abduction. What were your thoughts during the seven years about your parents? Did you think about them? And if so, what, what went through your mind? Um, through the seven years, I don't remember what went through my mind, but I thought of my parents very often. This poor seven-year-old boy now thinks that his parents didn't want him anymore. Parnell told him his new name was Dennis Parnell and that he would live as his son. He enrolled him in school under that name, but used his real birthday. According to Stephen, most of the time, Parnell would keep him happy by spoiling him, not being strict, and giving him a dog. There were the other times, though Parnell has always denied it, that Stephen said the man would molest and rape him. Stephen said that Parnell molested him the first night in the cabin. He said the man started raping him 13 days later. He also claimed that Parnell would beat him severely if he didn't obey. They moved around California quite a bit. Eventually, Stephen was able to come and go as he pleased, and he would also stay home alone for periods of time when Parnell was out of town. Stephen said that he could have tried to escape at those times, but didn't know who to contact and wasn't sure if Parnell's story about his parents was true. For all he knew, his parents didn't want him and Parnell was his legal guardian. Once Stainer became a teenager, Parnell started to lose interest in him. He tried to get the boy to help him abduct a new child, but Stephen would always mess up the kidnapping. Stephen would say in a later interview that he would do that intentionally because he didn't want another kid to go through what he did. On February 14, 1980, Parnell used a different accomplice, a minor named Sean Poorman, to help him lure in another child. This time, he kidnapped five-year-old Timothy White from Ukiah, California. To Stephen's horror, Parnell just showed up at their cabin with Timothy. Stephen knew what was in store for the boy if he didn't act soon. He didn't want Timothy to experience what he had. As he grew older, he started doubting the story that Parnell had told him about his parents, and the abduction of another young boy confirmed his suspicions. On March 1, 1980, Stephen waited for Parnell to leave for his night job. He put Timothy on his back, and he carried him out to the highway. He was able to hitch a ride to Ukiah, where they tried to find Timmy's house, but they eventually walked to the police station. Stephen was originally questioned as someone who might have been involved in Timothy's abduction, but after an extensive search of missing persons posters, it was finally verified that he was also a missing child. Parnell was arrested on the morning of March 2, 1980. He was tried for kidnapping both boys, but they weren't able to charge him with sexual assault. He was sentenced to seven years in prison and was released after five. Irvin Murphy was sentenced to five years in prison and was released after two. 
Sean Poorman, was sent to a juvenile work camp. Stephen Stainer became a local hero. He saved a five-year-old boy from a pedophile and escaped his own captivity. They wrote a book about him and even made a TV miniseries called I Know My Real Name Is Stephen, named after the book of the same name, by Mike Eccles. Of course, living for seven years as a child sex slave caused him to have some serious mental health issues. He married and had two children, but people claimed he lived a reckless life, and unfortunately, he died in a motorcycle accident on September 16, 1989. Then, 14-year-old Timothy White was one of the pallbearers at his funeral. I'd love to say that that's the last we hear of Kenneth Parnell, but it isn't. After getting out of prison in 1985, he stayed out of trouble, or at least didn't get caught for anything, but eventually his health started declining. He had a stroke which left him with a number of ailments, plus he had diabetes and emphysema. By 2003, he required round-the-clock care. Parnell had solicited his caregiver, Diane Stevens, with finding him a child to purchase. Diane claimed he instructed her to find him a boy with a, quote, clean rectum, end quote. Unlike Parnell's last two accomplices, Diane went to the police and worked with them to set up a sting operation. She led Parnell to believe that she had found a four-year-old boy that he could purchase for $500. He gave her $100 to obtain a fake birth certificate and had $400 in cash on him to complete the purchase. On January 3rd, 2003, Parnell was expecting to exchange his $400 for a four-year-old boy, but instead, he was arrested. He told authorities that he just wanted a family, which everyone knew was complete bullshit. On February 9, 2004, Kenneth Parnell was convicted of attempting to purchase a child and attempted child molestation. Even though no real child was targeted, evidence found in his home consisting of sexual aids and pornography helped prove his intentions. Along with that was testimony from Diane Stevens, Timothy White, and Sean Poorman. Kenneth Parnell was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison due to California's Three Strikes Law. He died of natural causes on January 21, 2008. If you want to hear about what becomes of Stephen's brother, Carrie Stainer, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out when it's published next week. If you like this video, please hit subscribe, click like, or leave me a comment. If you'd like to support the show, you can find ways at thisismonsters.com forward slash support. You can also look in the video description for links on how to do that. Thank you again for your support.